This is the Maverick Minister Deranged Bible Stories podcast series. Hi, I'm Mike Davis, and welcome to the Maverick Minister podcast. As we begin this second episode, I want to introduce you to Grace Smith, who will be the voice of Eve during the episodes in the rest of this series. If you've listened to the first podcast in this series, then you might remember that these somewhat unique stories are based on my deranged thoughts regarding certain readings from the Jewish and Christian scriptures. This one, like the first, is based on the first few chapters of the book of Genesis. I would like to remind everyone that these stories in no way claim divine inspiration, nor do they seek to demean the writings in the Bible. My only hope is that they might be enlightening for some of you, and if not enlightening, maybe they will at least be entertaining. This story is based on the second part of the creation narrative in the book of Genesis. Here is deranged thought number two. This story picks up right after the creation is finished, when everything is perfect. God had created human beings and had something made in God's own image to love and to be in relationship with. And human beings had an intimate, loving, and ever-present relationship with God. Not to mention the most perfect place in all of the creation to live and share their lives with each other in God. This should have been a story about how wonderful life was for Adam and Eve and God. But that isn't how it turns out. In the midst of perfect, Something went wrong. What was it? Chapter 2 What Went Wrong? Adam and Eve did very well in the garden for a while. They walked a lot, and sat a lot, and looked at flowers and trees and stars and birds and clouds and the sky and each other a lot. Basically, they led a perfectly lovely life. A lot. Actually, it must have been just a little bit too lovely and too perfect. Because it didn't take Adam and Eve long to get fed up with the garden, tired of perfection, and bored enough with everything to begin believing that God had handed them a less than fair deal when he offered them this wonderful life in Eden. It was anything but wonderful as far as they were concerned. But neither of them knew what to do about it. One morning, Eve was walking around in the garden talking to herself. She had to talk to someone. God never said very much to her, and Adam certainly was no sterling conversationalist. She said, Oh, what a bore this is, perfection. Here, perfection, there, nothing but perfection as far as the eye can see. Perfection is all right, I guess, but my God, a little bit of it certainly goes a long way. There has to be something more to life than this. Of course there is, said a voice from off in the bushes. At that moment, Eve stopped walking, talking, and breathing. She had never heard anyone else's voice but Adam's and God's before, and this voice wasn't either one of theirs. It was different, soft and gentle, with a lilting kind of invitation in it. It was a masculine voice, but it had a magnetic quality about it that made her almost feel like she was being pulled off the path toward the bushes where the sound was. Didn't you hear me, dear? I said there is something more to life than all of this perfection. Who, who are you? There was a rustling, and suddenly Eve looked, and she gazed upon the most sophisticated, well-dressed serpent she had ever seen as he rose up out of the bushes. His snakeskin suit was a lime green. He wore a diamond stick pin in his tie and a genuine imitation Rolex watch around the middle of his tail. His teeth and eyes shined so in the sunlight when he looked at her and smiled that he felt a little lightheaded, as if she'd been out in the sun for too long. Perhaps I should introduce myself. Lucifer T. Reptile's the name, and leading folks down the garden path is what I do best. He moved over to Eve, wrapped his tail around her shoulder, and said, Why don't we walk for a bit, my dear? Now, I couldn't help but notice that you look a little down in the mouth this morning. You look like you're bored with life, unfulfilled, unexcited, 
unchallenged. Tell me, do you have trouble getting to sleep at night? Eve nodded. Do you have trouble waking up? Do you feel lately like you've lost your excitement about life? Your get up and go? Eve nodded again. Well, my dear friend, and you are my friend, I know just what your problem is. What? Perfectionopathy. Perfection what? Perfectionopathy. It's a mysterious and terrible malady that strikes boredom into the very heart and soul of all people who have to live with someone or something that is perfect for any length of time. Have you ever had it? Oh, no. Snakes don't get it. Only people. I think it has something to do with your hormones. But never fear, because I have the answer to your problem. I have the solution to your dilemma. Would you like to be healed? Oh, yes. Would you like to be in control of your life? Oh, yes. I would. I would. Would you like some variety? Would you like to see new places, have new mountains to climb? Would you like to get out of this place and know what it is to be excited and adventurous and alive? Oh, yes, yes. Please tell me how. The serpent stopped for a moment and looked at Eve out of the corner of his eye while a wide, toothy grin moved across his face as he spoke. It's very simple, my dear. Just get rid of the perfection here in Eden, and all of those things will be yours. Get rid of the perfection? How am I going to do that? I thought you'd never ask. With that, the snake took his tail off her shoulder and pointed down the garden path with it. My dear friend, and you are my friend, you can get rid of the perfection just by eating some of the fruit that is growing on that tree right over there on your left. At that moment, Eve stopped walking and talking and breathing again. And then she looked at the snake and said, Are you crazy? That's the tree God told us to stay away from. God said if we ate that fruit, we'd get kicked out of this garden forever, and besides that, we'd die. How dare you tell me to eat that fruit? Oh, no. I'm not daring at all. I'm just a simple and caring creature who has only your best interest at heart. He sounded both hurt and sincere and Eve felt a little guilty about the tone of voice she had just used. Why do you suppose that God told you all of those things about that fruit? I don't know. He didn't really explain it. But then again, he doesn't explain anything. He just said, don't eat it. Maybe the fruit is poison, or maybe it tastes really bad, or maybe it's all. I don't know. There must be a good reason. But God never tells us why he does anything. Well, there is a good reason. And I want you to understand that I would never want to speak badly of God. But I just can't stand to see a sweet kid like you being taken advantage of this way. So I will tell you the truth about why he doesn't want anybody eating that fruit. You will? Eve moved closer to the serpent's lips. Oh, yes, indeed. Just sit down here and let me tell you all about it. You see, God told you not to eat that fruit because he wants to keep you down on the farm, under his thumb, as it were. What he told you was a lie. You won't die if you eat that fruit. Instead of dying, you'll become as smart as he is. He told you not to eat it, because he can't stand to have anyone else be as smart as he is. I almost got to be as smart as him once. And look what he did to me. No hands, no arms, no legs, no feet. But if you eat the fruit, he won't be able to do anything to you. You'll be too quick for him, too sharp. You'll be brilliant. Just imagine it for a moment. Eve, B.A., M.S., Ph.D. Eve, in charge of her own life at last. 
Eve as smart as God. It sounds pretty good, doesn't it? One bite is all that it will take. Eve was sitting there thinking about what it would be like to be as smart as God, when suddenly a different thought occurred to her. Wait a minute. Are you sure? I mean, you've never eaten any of that fruit now, have you? What if you're wrong? I could die, you know. Not to worry. Not to worry. I wouldn't put you in any danger like that. Who do you think I am? Oh, no. Eat that fruit and you won't die. I guarantee it. Oh, no. You'll be as smart as God. Maybe even smarter. Now, my dear friend, and you are my friend, who are you going to believe? A God who never tells you anything? Or me? From that day forward, life in this world has never been perfect again. But at least it hasn't been boring. <laughs> So this is the part where the nitty-gritty, rubber-hits-the-road spiritual concept that is supposed to be helpful comes in. You see, the story begins with a suggestion that at least for Eve, living with perfection was unfulfilling, unsatisfying, and incredibly frustrating. In fact, living with perfection for her was as bad as living with nothing was for God before the creation. That story is in podcast number one of this series, by the way. So, was perfection the problem? Perfection is supposed to be a good thing. It's always supposed to give us exactly what we want, when we want it, and in the way that we want it. Otherwise, it wouldn't be perfect. So, what's the problem with that? The problem is that living in perfection is a totally self-seeking and egocentric endeavor. Since the whole idea of perfect is always subjective and always all about us and what we think we want. The great poet and playwright Oscar Wilde once wrote, The only thing worse than not getting what you want is getting what you want. If Mr. Wilde was right, and I believe that he was and is, then what do we do when getting everything we think we want isn't satisfying and fulfilling? Ah, that's where temptation comes in. Because temptation is that incredibly creative and extremely destructive human capacity to tell ourselves that we are the center of the universe. And so, what temptation suggests will actually bring us fulfillment, satisfaction, and happiness is not relationship with God or relationship with anyone else. Temptation tells us to focus on ourself because we are the only one who really knows, cares about, or understands what we really need. And since temptation lives inside our mind, it does its very best to sell us what we think we really need to make our life perfect. And what is that? What is temptation trying to sell us? Temptation is always selling the same thing. Power, control, superiority, and divinity. It always tries to convince us that either we are or we can become our own God. And so we don't really need any other God. In fact, we don't really need anything or anyone beyond ourselves. All we have to do to achieve personal divinity and to make life perfect for us is to eat the forbidden fruit, whatever that fruit happens to be for us at the time. But as we already discovered in Chapter 1, the ability to choose love in a relationship is why we were created in the image of God in the first place. And so our purpose in life is to choose loving a relationship with God and each other and to live in those kind of life-giving relationships. That is what makes life satisfying and fulfilling for us. And since those relationships are all about going beyond self-focused desires in favor of considering the needs of others, then anything that is totally self-centered, anything that we think is perfect, will always be empty and meaningless. You see, genuine perfection is actually the polar opposite of self-centeredness. And it has nothing to do with getting everything we want. 
It's about sharing everything we have. There is a kind of backwards physics to all of this. The more we give of ourselves and seek to love and care for others, the more everything that we really want and need comes to us. Maybe the closest we can ever get to real perfection is a relationship in which we experience and practice unconditional love for someone other than ourselves. Maybe the only way we can even imagine that is in experiencing God's unconditional love for us. As I said at the conclusion of podcast number one, I honestly don't know for sure. But it does make sense to me. So the deranged creation story continues in podcast number three of this series. This one wraps up the creation narrative in Genesis and has a whole different set of questions about the consequences of our thoughts and actions. Uh, uh, uh.